Welcome Saints. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Jesus' return in the infamous Mark, which is from the book uh, From Church to Bride. Um, so Jesus is coming back, as we all know. So, brief history lesson here. <coughs> okay, firstly, you know, Jesus was resurrected in AD 32. Um, some interesting dates, AD 32 is the most important date of course, AD 312, <coughs> AD 381, AD 1512, and 2024. Why are these dates important? Okay, so 312 AD was when Constantine legalised Christianity. So before 312 AD, Christianity was illegal in Rome, um, and it was constantly persecuted from its inception all the way through to here. Um, it was constantly persecuted. Many, many believers were, were murdered. Um, but nonetheless, through that period of time, we've got the greatest growth in Christianity in history. Uh, it spread from a little town near Jerusalem um, across the, the Roman world. And it shouldn't have happened because Jesus was actually died, was crucified, he was dead. You know, the, the religion should have stopped there. But, of course, the Holy Spirit um, in God's people, his body, expressed himself um, on the earth. And, and they did this through here. But they did this not as a church. But this is the period of the ecclesia, you know, the local ecclesia, house group thing, which I've gone into in previous times of course 312 to 381 um, was when the when the God's people really really suffered immensely from a different problem and that was that Constantine because he legalized Christianity it became the political um, he merged the economic and political system with with Christianity and came up with this thing which we which we still suffer from today and um, but 312 um, to 381, in the middle of all of this, and I can't remember the exact dates and I haven't looked it up, but the canon of scripture came into being about here. And that's also significant because in 381, the reason that's significant is because we have our first official state church. The church system or the church age started here. The church started in 381, not the, not the body of believers, the church system, the one that we, we see today, started in 381. 1512, so this was the Roman Catholic Church. It was the only church. It was the state church. Still very powerful today. But in those days, between this period of time here, we call the Dark Ages. And the reason is the Roman Catholic Church system which is integrated, of course, into the world's political and economic system, became incredibly powerful. Anyone that stood up to the Roman Catholic Church was burnt to the stake or murdered and tortured um, and had their property stolen and everything else. So um, about somewhere, there are some other people in here. There's, there's a guy called Hess who was in um, what's modern uh, Bohemia or modern-day Czechoslovakia. There's another guy called Jerome. And, and there's actually many, many people that God raised up to, to um, teach the message that this, this, this beast here um, wasn't behaving in, the, in a Christian way. And so they pre preached a different message. Both Hess and Jerome were both um, burnt to the stake. In 1512, this became significant. This is Martin Luther finally broke through the Roman Catholic Church system. So the Protestant movement started here with Martin Luther. Um, there were some breakaways before him. The Orthodox churches came out. Came out in the middle here. Um, but the Protestant churches came in, in here. And then in 1905... You had your Pentecostal churches. 
But the point I'm trying to make here is they're all churches. And if you actually look at the history of any church, you'll find that they all started off. Often they had the Holy Spirit's power driving them to start with, and people were just loving God and everything else because God loves his people, pours himself upon his people regardless of where they are. The Bible says we're two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. So, um, so he used the Roman Catholic Church, he used the Protestant Church, he used the Pentecostal Church, um, he used the Baptist Church, he used all of these churches, um, and God's people predominantly abided within this church system. Righty, so, um, so that leads us into, um, we'll, we'll get into the, the meaning of all of this stuff and how important it is um, later on. But that's basically a little history of the church system, a very brief history of the church system. The other thing I might make a note of, it's interesting, the canon scripture was, was put into place here. And the Roman Catholic Church fanatically protected the canon of Scripture. Um, had they known what they were doing, I'm pretty sure they would have wiped it out. Because in 1512, in Martin Luther, had the, the first truth was restored, which was justification by faith. So in other words, you can't earn your salvation. It's freely given. And it's given because of faith, not because of money or works. Um, this went right against the Roman Catholic Church doctrine. Um, in those days, they were completely corrupted. They actually sold, if you wanted salvation, you bought it. You paid the church money. If you could go out and murder someone and get a certificate saying that you're okay, you can't put me in jail because I'm, I've, you know, I've paid money to have my sins forgiven. So it was that that got this man here really, really um, um, seeking to find the answers to, to what was going on. And he challenged the, the church system. But the point is... The, the Roman Catholic Church protected the scripture or the canon of scripture throughout the entire Dark Ages and it was only here. Now what's significant here, so during the Dark Ages most truths, almost, well pretty much every Christian truth and doctrine was, was wiped out. The Roman Catholic Church created their own rules and regulations, they created their own doctrines and they created their own um, empire essentially. So if, if I was to draw it, it would kind of go like this. It would go downhill to no truth. But from this moment, 1512, it comes back up again. And you see this, particularly after 1900. 1900, the, the truths that have been restored to God's people since 1900 is, is phenomenal. You know, if you look at the church in, in 1512, it was pretty much not much different to any Roman Catholic Church. In fact, you can see examples of it with the Lutherans and the Anglican churches today. Um, the only thing they'd come up with was, was, of course, justification by faith. It's the water baptism of immersion, uh, uh, speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit, praise and worship. Um, the list goes on. It just goes on and on and on. And, and so if, if you were to transpose this to over here, we're still going. It's still going up. Truth is still being restored. And part of, you know, what I teach and preach about the Ecclesia is part of this this going up. You know, God is wanting to reform his people as a back into the local Ecclesia being the driving force behind um, his power on earth and not the church system anymore. He's, he wants to get his people out of that eventually. And, um, you know, he still pours out his blessing upon people in it. 80% of my brothers and sisters belong to this system. Um, there's some that go to house churches, there's some that don't go anywhere. Um, but this, this system is going to get uglier and uglier and uglier, um, as opposed to the ecclesia system, which is going to become more apparent and, and um, going to shine because God's people... Um, have to behave in a different manner to, to the Roman Catholic political and economic system. We have to understand that church, church, politics and money all go together. And if you look at some of the crap that goes on within the body of within the church system today, you'll see that it involves politics, it involves money. Um, we meant we need to be we are a, a political Christianity is a political system. It represents the kingdom of God. It's a political system. 
Anyway, I'm getting off track a wee bit. So we'll get back on track. Um, so if you look at the parable of the virgins in Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13, okay, in the parable of the of the virgins, you'll find that every one of them, all ten virgins, were asleep. The wise ones and the foolish ones. And it's kind of like, well, we are asleep today. How do I know that we're asleep today? Um, we're not effective. We did not do. We're not doing what this, these ecclesia people, the early believers did. You know, we're trying, you know, the gospel's not spreading across the world in, in, a, in, a, in a, like wildfire. Um, the other thing is that in order to do that, we have to work with the Holy Spirit as a, as a people. And if you read about, you know, uh, Revelation two and Revelation three, God called His ecclesia um, in Ephesus and. Philadelphia and so on, menorah. But he talk, if you look at the one about Ephesus, you'll find that I will remove my menorah out of her. So the menorah, as I'll, I'll talk about in another chapter, of course, is, is the interaction between the Holy Spirit and his people. Um, but it was always in a group, always represents, a menorah always represents a group of people. The menorah. Israel, the national symbol of Israel is the menorah. It represents the entirety of the completeness of Israel. The menorah today, um, if God's people want to function as a menorah, we have to have the Holy Spirit as one with us and we have to be one with it, with each other in a geographical area. Um, and without of that, outside of that, it doesn't work. And... Um, particularly if you're involved in this, you know, the politics and econ ec economics of the world system. So this is all, um, so this all, so we go back to the, um, the the ten virgins and they're awakened, right? Yeah, they they come at the end of the age. We are, in, we are betrothed to Jesus Christ because of Pentecost. We're engaged, essentially. We, he is our lover. We, we live for him. We want, we await um, with passion for his return. Because in the Jewish um, thing, wedding ceremony, um, once everything's organised, the, the groom goes away to the father's house and prepares a place, builds a place onto the father's house. So that, and when it's finished, the father tells the son he can go and pick up his bride. And that's that's what God's talking about when he talks about these, these ten virgins and, and lots of other passages in the New Testament. So Jesus is coming back for his bride. Now he he does that at the end. When she's ready, when he's ready, he comes to get her, and some of them go back to the wedding. Um so but some miss out. And that's the tragedy of all. But um so it happens at the end. There's no nothing after that. It's the end. Okay, so that's that's significant. Um, so I'll read another scripture, which is um, do, 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 do. Revelations. Um, they said. These are those who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 7 verse 9, by the way. So Revelation 7 verse 9. These are those who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They came out of the great tribulation. If we are all taken out before the great tribulation, we will not be doing that. There will not be any great group of people um, washed with robes. Um, but it clearly says that they came out of the Great Tribulation. So these, these people come out of the Great Tribulation. Let's pretend, let's pretend that the Great Tribulation starts today. So these are people, so we all get raptured according to some people. Um, so where do these people come from? Doesn't make any sense, does it? So there has to be, the other thing that's that of note is that why would God prepare a people? Why would he spend 2,000 years? Remember, he spent from here to here preparing a people. He's preparing a bride. He's coming back for a bride who's ready for him. Why would he do that if he's just going to take her out? The third, the third thing is, um, 
God did not send the Son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Um, John 3.17. So, there will never be a time when there is no repentance, and I'll talk about that um, shortly. Other scriptures, uh, John 17 is an absolute, um, if you want to know God's will on all of this, read John 17. John 17, verse 15, Jesus, um, the, the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17 tells us the heart, his heart in, 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 in all of this, and he must have known that there's going to be great debate around pre-trib, post-trib, and, you know, um, because this is what this is written for. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Speaking of this time period, the seven years, because this is the only time where, where God talks about taking us out. Um, and he was praying to the disciples at that stage. But further on in verse 20, he says, my prayer is not for them alone, but for all believers in, in Jesus. So, so he's talking about all believers in this entire time period. It's not my will that you should take them out but that you should protect them from the evil one. That includes this. That's his, that's his will. He wants us to be in the earth. He wants us to be the salt of the earth. He wants us to, he wants to display his glory on the earth. We are hidden. We are missing in action at the moment. But when we awaken, um, you know, this beautiful bride awakens. Won't be part of this system. She awakens and the world suddenly goes, Whoa! And, you know, by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. And, and so part of that awakening is, is the outpouring of, of God's love within his people so that they can love others. Radio. So um, that's pretty much it for the first session. But I'm going to talk about this again. And I'm going to talk about repentance during the tribulation and the saving of a remnant. Thank you.